Welcome to the virtual rebroadcast of PubK's 2024 Government Contracts Annual Review. During this week, we are presenting 14 panel discussions featuring more than 70 expert practitioners, as well as two in-depth conversations with key government officials. PubK publishes news and insights for the government contracts community, such as PubK protests and claims, PubK cybersecurity and data privacy, and PubK compliance and enforcement. In addition to our annual review, we also host webinars, podcasts, and in-person networking meetings during the year. If you'd like to learn more about PubK, visit us online at pubkgroup.com. All of this week's presentations were recorded live at our in-person conference in February at the Ronald Reagan International Trade Center. You can join any or all of these sessions during the week using the same link and password you use today. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. Your video will remain disabled through the entire session. Many of our panelists are joining us today to answer questions about their presentations. Enter your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and the panel will address as many as possible during the webinar. If time allows, we'll open up a live Q&A session after the video presentation. Our briefing book, which includes all of this week's slide presentations and other materials, are available for download from the PubK website. We are applying for continuing legal education CLE approval in Virginia, California, Texas, Florida, Colorado, and Kansas. While we cannot guarantee approval, we expect acceptance within the next few weeks. We will notify all attendees when those approvals have been received. If you received CLEs for our in-person event, you can apply for additional CLEs for panels that you may have missed. And finally, if you are interested in obtaining CLE, please look for our poll question during the presentation. The state boards require us to verify your participation during the event. The poll is a simple yes-no question. We will keep track of all responses to verify that you viewed the panel. If you do not wish to obtain CLE credit, you can disregard the poll. This conference would not have been possible without the strong support of our event sponsors, all of whom are listed on the next few slides. Our sponsors also provided speakers for our event and other valuable input. We encourage you to review the strengths and capabilities of these firms and to reach out to them directly with any questions you may have. And now we present our next panel, Commercial Item Contracting. Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Mullen, and welcome to PubK's Commercial Item Contracting panel. Uh, this afternoon, uh, I'll be speaking to you with three other panelists that I'll introduce to you now. First of all, again, my name is Kevin Mullen. I'm a partner in Morrison and Forrester's government contracts practice. I'll be discussing three important cases concerning government contracting this afternoon. Next on our list is Sam Knowles, who's a partner and co-chair in DLA Piper's government contracts practice. Sam is gonna to speak to you about regulatory and policy developments in the commercial item space. Next, Jason Workmaster, who's a member at Miller and Chevalier will focus on developments for commercial item contracting in the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2024. And finally, Jeff Clayton, who's a principal at Baker Tilly, will talk about commercial item determinations, record keeping, and other issues that we'll cover today. So let me kick it off. First of all, I'm going to cover three notable cases that are before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit that deal with issues involving commercial item contracting. Two of those cases originated at the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, and one originated at the Civilian Board of Contract Appeals with a very, very recent decision from the Federal Circuit. So let's get started. First of all, I'd like to talk to you about ACLR LLC versus United States, which is now at the Federal Circuit. 
That case had to do with a claim for recovery under commercial item termination for convenience clause, which you see on your slide is FAR 52.212-4L, Lima. That case hinged on the question of the adequacy of the contractor's system for recording costs its standard record keeping system as that portion of the of the clause calls it out the question before the court was before going to trial we need to determine whether what the contractor is going to put forward as damages evidence originates from a record keeping system that is sufficient under the clause if it's not then the case in the in the judge's view should not go forward this was judge patricia uh campbell smith at the court of federal claims so the situation involved about a 40 million dollar claim and um the contractor described its record keeping system as virtually all the documents that the company maintained through all of its systems that included Quicken, um, that included Microsoft uh, Outlook, uh, Microsoft Explorer, and all the papers maintained, papers and files maintained by its various employees. So in order to demonstrate its termination charges, the company proposed to the court that it would consult and bring evidence from all those sources. Well, this raised the issue for the government. Well, Your Honor, if the contractor is going to call its standard record keeping system all of its documents and files, doesn't that indicate they don't have a system at all? Well, for the court, uh, the issue was a novel one. It hadn't been uh, before the court before in terms of how to interpret 52.212-4L. So the court looked to the plain language of that provision and analyzed what does it mean to be a standard record keeping system, focusing on standard as a word and system as a word, consulting in a dictionary. And the court came to the conclusion you have to have some method that is organized and systematic. And what the contractor is proposing to use as the source of its evidence of added costs attributable to the termination just didn't meet that standard. So the, the judge canceled the hearing and dismissed the case. So uh, that's up on appeal to the federal circuit. Oral argument is pending. Now, before we go forward, uh, Jeff, I'd like you to comment on what does this mean for commercial item contractors? Should we be concerned that there's a standard being applied here that commercial item contractors are at risk of not being able to meet. I'll turn it over to you, Jeff, for commentary. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, and it, it definitely raises an interesting question, right? Um, because the commercial items clause and what it speaks to here is not very specific. I think it pretty much just says standard record, record keeping system. Um, and for contractors who maybe aren't subject to the cost principles or the cost accounting standards, um, you know, what, what ultimately does this mean? And I'll, I'll point out before I go on, I believe that one of our esteemed panelists today and, and the CGP um, filed an amic amicus brief related to this case. I just wanted to give a nod to, to Jason here, who's uh, on, the, uh, on the broadcast with us on, on that one. Um, I think CGP and, and Jason's arguments were focused on whether or not the, the definition of a standard system really even mattered here, um, and whether the real issue was about whether there was simply enough evidence to support uh, ACLR's claims. Um, but putting those aside and assuming that contractors want to be positioned to avoid uh, a similar finding in the event of a termination for convenience uh, or some other claim on a commercial item contracts, I wanted to share some thoughts about maybe what companies should be thinking about as they perform and keep records related to their performance, their invoices, so on and so forth. Um, you know, I, I think that companies would generally think that uh, operating on a commercial item contract, I believe this one was under the under the GSA schedules, um, 
uh, and I believe it may have been a fixed price contract as well, um, that if you perform, you meet your milestones, you invoice, you collect, and you should be good to go. Um, I think that's true in most cases, um, but in, in this cases, it wasn't. Um, you know, and I think generally for, for any company, whether you're operating in the government contracts world or, world or not, you know, when you think about your, your system of books and records, uh, you want to be able to account for your revenues, for your expenses and costs, uh, and for other things for a variety of reasons beyond a, a government contract claim, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, when I think of an accounting system and an overall record keeping system, uh, I think it can take a number of different forms, right? I think you can accomplish what you need to in a setup that, that includes QuickBooks, uh, along with strong policies and procedures and maybe other record keeping systems. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that whatever your system is, though, the key is that it should be organized. Um, there should be policies, procedures and controls associated with the system. Uh, the information contained in those systems should be checked, should be reconciled, should be reviewed, um, and it should be supported by artifacts that the company holds and owns uh, that maybe aren't housed elsewhere. And I think in this case, the company may be having been pointed to records kept by other companies as part of its support for its claim. Um, you know, uh, end of the day, uh, I might have mentioned this a little bit already. I think you want to be able to track revenue, uh, invoicing accounts receivable, expenses and payables information, payroll information, um, either within that single kind of accounting system or that accounting system combined with a variety of other kind of systems. And, and again, those other systems can, can take multiple forms, uh, but I don't think they wanna be organized, they wanna be controls around them, uh, they wanna be owned by that company. Um, you know, in this specific case, we're talking about a commercial item contract under a GSA schedule, uh, so it's not going to include the FAR, uh, what's it, 52215-2 clause, which is the audit clause for negotiated contracts. And that points to FAR 4.7, uh, which is the record keeping requirements. Um, and so while not required, I do think that companies may want to look at those record keeping requirements to think about the types of things that they want to keep records on, have access to and used to support their invoices and claims. Um, you know, uh, I also think uh, about GSA schedule contracts, uh, which again, that, that this was a task order on a GSA schedule, schedule contract. Those contracts contain two different audit clauses um, covering both kind of pre-award and post-award audit rights. Um, those clauses speak to the government's uh, right and ability to examine records that assess that would assess them, among other things, pricing, billings, the price reductions clause. Um, uh, you know, and I think if you read this clause as well, uh, you could interpret it to mean that you may end up needing to support whatever it is that you want to invoice and recover fees for from the government. Um, I think you're also talking about services here. When you think about a services company, some kind of a timekeeping system is going to be uh, very important, right? Um, and again, in this case, uh, you know, the, the, the guidelines for a timekeeping system that are outlined in the DCAM are not uh, specifically going to be applicable. Uh, but I still think that that's not a bad place to look when you think about a timekeeping system and the types of controls, policies, and processes that you want to have around it. Um, end of the day, there, there's no specific prescribed method for what a standard record keeping system is here uh, and the right way to go about this. Um, but again, you want to be able to support the information included on invoices. You want to be able to support uh, the costs that you're recording in your systems. Um, and you want to be able to produce artifacts that support those things. So um, again, commercial item contracts, cost accounting is not a requirement. But you need to, needed to be able to support your costs in a termination here. Um, and so you do not need a full-on cost accounting system, but you want to be able to get back at those costs and have a systematic method for recording those costs so that you can present them in a case like this. Thanks, Kevin. We can flip back to you. Okay, why don't we go on to the next slide, which discusses the next of the three cases I'll talk to you about today, Abu Technologies Corporation versus Department of Health and Human Services, 
and General Services Administration. This was before the Civilian Board of Contract Appeals. And this is the case that I alluded to in the opening uh, for which we have the Fed Circuit decision. Uh, it was issued in between the original session for this panel and today. So it was issued last week. So this is hot off the presses. Let's talk about the Civilian Board of Contract Appeals decision first, and then I'll tell you uh, what the Federal Circuit uh, did on appeal. So ABU has to do with um, the question of whether a software manufacturer who's selling to the government through a reseller under the GSA's Federal Supply Schedule program can uh, bring a claim against the government for violation of its end user agreement, despite the fact that the software manufacturer in that scenario does not have privity of contract um, for the acquisition, for the sale of the software, it does have the end user agreement, however. So the question before the civilian board uh, on a uh, motion for summary judgment was, uh, do we have jurisdiction under the Contract Disputes Act by virtue of a procurement contract? So the question became, is, does the end user agreement constitute a procurement contract? That's at least how the civilian board looked at the question before them. So uh, the civilian board went through an analysis of that question uh, by addressing it from a number of different issues. First, uh, first of all, the board acknowledged that the EUA, as we'll call it, was not for the purchase of the software. It was a statement of the rights and obligations of the end user um, in favor of the software manufacturer. So the government end user was uh, purportedly bound by the EUA, so couldn't violate the license terms. And the board took that for granted without addressing it directly, said, let's take for granted for now that's an enforceable agreement. And even with that assumption, the board concluded that it wasn't a procurement contract because the government was paying the reseller, in this case, Kerasoft, for the software. Kerasoft was delivering the software to the government. The software manufacturer, Abu Technologies, was not part of that transaction, notwithstanding the fact that the EUA was assumed to be enforceable. So no procurement contract, no jurisdiction under the Contract Disputes Act, which requires a procurement contract, and therefore case dismissed. So then it goes to the Federal Circuit. Now, this isn't on your slides because it's so recent. And the Federal Circuit disagreed and vacated the Civilian Board's decision, saying that dismissal of the case for lack of jurisdiction for lack of a procurement contract, lack of CDA jurisdiction, is not appropriate on a summary basis. The Federal Circuit said that is a question that should be addressed on the merits. Does a procurement contract exist? It requires the exchange of evidence, requires the analysis of that evidence to determine whether there was an, uh, a procurement contract at issue bestowing jurisdiction. So you can't do that sum summarily without a record, civilian board, so, so your dismissal is vacated and it's remanded. And the federal circuit went on to say, all that's needed in a case like that to maintain jurisdiction at the board under the CDA is a non-frivolous allegation that you have a contract with the government. That's it. And that was established at the civilian board. So back to the civilian board, it goes to see whether a procurement contract exists after they look at the evidence. Now, that's an interesting development because it's been assumed pretty much up to this point. And we thought it was confirmed by the civilian board that an EUA did not dis bestow upon a software manufacturer the, the right to sue the government for abusing a license. Well, we'll see now. We're a step closer, that's for sure. All right, next slide, please. 
The final case I'll talk about is Precipient AI. This is a case uh, that was decided by Senior Judge Brugink at the Court of Federal Claims and is a, a strange little uh, case in terms of its procedural development. First of all, uh, the question before the court really was, what is the extent of the government's obligations? And what are, what are the extent of the rights bestowed under the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act on companies that have not submitted a proposal in a competitive solicitation, but nonetheless would like to provide a commercial item, let's say a component of a system, under that program? That's the question. And up to this point, it's pretty much been assumed that you're not going to be considered an interested party. You're not going to be considered someone with standing to bring an allegation under FASA against the government for not uh, fulfilling its obligation to use commercial items to the maximum extent practical and to, to structure its procurements that way. You're not going to have standing unless you've submitted a proposal uh, for that solicitation, or you'd be in a position to submit a proposal. There's some play in the joints in the Court of Federal Claims uh, jurisdiction, jurisdictional uh, jurisprudence in that regard, but those are the basics. So, so could we extend a right to sue under FASA to a non-bidder? That, that, that was the question. So in this case, let's talk about the facts. You had this company, Percipient AI, that had developed a very um, advanced computer vision platform. Com computer vision is exactly what it sounds like. It's a uh, system for uh, analyzing and compiling visual images. And in this case, that, that system would be used for uh, intelligence purposes by the National Geospatial uh, agency. So um, Percipient AI had this whiz-bang platform. They saw that NGA had issued a solicitation called Sapphire that was hoping to procure two things, a depository for various um, uh, sources of that computer type information on one hand, and on the other hand, the computer vision platform itself. Now, Percipient AI couldn't do the depository, but it could do the computer vision. So it determined we can't answer the entire solicitation, so we're not going to bid. But once this thing is awarded, then we'll pursue uh, the, the sale of our computer vision commercial solution to the prime contractor and to the agency. And that's what they did. So award went to Khaki. And of course, you know the story in these kinds of cases. Khaki was going to develop the computer vision. Well, Percipient went to Khaki and said, you don't need to do that. We have a commercial uh, advanced solution for that. Khaki gave them the runaround. They ended up not getting anywhere with Khaki. So they went to NGA, and it ended up very much being the same story. They were frustrated by the fact they couldn't get NGA's attention. So they brought the protest. So the question then became for Judge Brugink, all right, we got a number of questions we have to answer here. First of all, this is a task order award. Does the court have jurisdiction? Secondly, all right, this is a, a possible subcontractor who didn't submit a proposal as a prime contractor. Do they have standing under FASA? Third, uh, what's the extent of the government's FASA obligations? This is after award. And finally, what about being after award um, and timeliness. Now, this was two years after award. So Precipient was after it for two years before they gave up and protested. So here's here's how this happened. First of all, Judge Brugink, in an in initial decision, so I say initial because there's a subsequent one, and I'm, I'm ruining the, uh, the punchline here, you'll see. Uh, in terms of task order jurisdiction, the judge initially found that the court had jurisdiction, notwithstanding uh, FASA's uh, exclusive jurisdiction for task order uh, protests at GAO. So we'll come back to that. Secondly, and this is where it gets more interesting, Judge Brueging found that recipient had standing 
that FASA bestows a cause of action on a company in percipient's position. They were ready to offer a commercial solution, and neither the agency nor the prime were open to that. And that is uh, providing standing to percipient. Now, in doing that, the judge did an interesting thing, and I think he got this wrong. He made the observation that in FASA, the statute talks about um, bidders and offerors. Now, we all know that those are loaded terms. Bidders under uh, sealed bidding, offerors under negotiated solicitations, those, those are terms of art. But that's not how the judge interpreted them. The judge interpreted them to mean two different things. Bidders or someone who submits a bid or proposal, offeror is someone else like recipient who doesn't do that, but offers the commercial item. And by virtue of that interpretation, the judge found that someone like recipient who didn't compete, is not a prime contractor, has standing to sue under uh, FASA. So finally, in terms of timeliness, the judge found that because the government remains obligated to fulfill its FASA obligations after award, this is the judge's interpretation, then timeliness was not violated here. Because that obligation continues, recipient can bring a case uh, suing about that violation well after award, like it did here. Now, here's the punchline. Judge Brugink went back and revisited this after issuing the initial decision, which denied a motion to dismiss, and ultimately granted the motion to dismiss. Dismiss. So we got this wrong. There is no jurisdiction over a task order award here at the court and away the case went. So you might say, well, Kevin, what, why didn't you start with that? Why is this even important to any of us? It's important because the judge's interpretation of FASA and its potential enormous breadth is something we ought to watch for in the future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sam Knowles. Sam, you're going to talk about developments and regulations and policies. Take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Kevin. Very interesting, as always. Yeah, if there's a theme in terms of regulations and policies this year, it's that it's really hard to change the status quo. I think, you know, you hear a lot of talk in, in terms of sort of the big picture policy rationale behind commercial item contracting and behind a streamlined acquisition process. And, you know, in those points, which I think we're all familiar with, it's you, you lower the barriers to entry, you get more participants in the market, you get more innovation, more competition, it's just better for everybody. And I don't know that anybody really disagrees with that sort of big picture wise, but when you get down, you know, to put it into practice, there's, there's resistance, I think, among the agencies, and we'll say in particular, uh, DOD, in terms of embracing some of that and maybe giving up some of the control or oversight that, that they might have. And, and sometimes a view that, and we can go on to the next slide, but a, a view that if you're not getting cost buildup data or you don't have you know, significant audit rights, that, that you're somehow giving up uh, significant rights or the contractor is somehow getting one over on, on the government. But um, we saw in the past year, a final rule here related to the inapplicability of certain laws and regulations to commercial items. So so as background, you know, going back 30 years to, to FASA, since October 1994, under statute as a statutory requirement, any new procurement law that's passed does not, by statute, apply to commercial item acquisitions or COTS acquisitions, except for three, three exceptions. One is if the statute specifically says it applies to commercial items. Two, if the statute provides for civil or criminal penalties, the thinking is it's significant enough, it should apply. And then the third one is that if the FAR Council makes a separate written determination that it's in the government's best interest for it to apply, then it can apply. So, you know, really behind the statute was this idea that the default rule should be new laws and regulations after 1994 do not apply to commercial item contracting. But what's happened over time is that third exception, you know, except where there's a specific determination that it should apply, has been used multiple times in many cases. And in, in some would say, I think I think fairly so, that it's subsumed to the rule in a sense. So you have over time, over the past three decades, any number of new compliance obligations, requirements, burdens being applicable to, to commercial item contractors so that this, this compliance burden has significantly grown over time. 
So you see what you know what I think are really um, diligent, well-meaning efforts by Congress to try to scale that back and to try to you know force the executive's hand to to scale that back. And this is an example of it. So this this partially implements Section 874, the FY 2017 NDAA. And what this basically said is that DOD is required to look at from January 2015 looking forward, look at D DOD unique um, statutes that have resulted in clauses applicable to commercial items under under the DFARS. And again, the default is you're going to look at those. You're going to look at commercial item, um, you, you know, statutes applicable to commercial items where there's been a clause applicable to them. And the default presumption under under the statute is that you're going to restrict them or limit them. Um, and then there, there's also a requirement then to um, redefine the, the definition of subcontractor to reduce some of the, the flow down burdens that you see. That subcontractor um, piece is being implemented under a separate DFARS case. But, but, you know, so you see, I think, you know, some fairly ambitious goals under the statute. And then when it's implemented, I think it's it's fair to say it's significantly less than, than maybe what the, the drafters of the NDAA um, anticipated. So, you know, you, you see this this rewrite of DFARS 252244-7000. And this is um, in terms of the prime uh, sub relationships and flow downs. And so the language has changed in the clause where it previously said that the prime is not required to flow down um, clauses unless they're specifically prescribed in, in the FAR, the DFARS. Um, and now it says you shall not include any of those clauses um, unless they are specifically prescribed in FAR Part 12 or um, otherwise in the FAR DFARS. So, you know, I, I think that's helpful in terms of you know, providing a principal basis, principal argument in those flow down negotiations between the prime and the sub. I think practically, you know, as as many folks will be aware, those those negotiations often turn on leverage. Um, you know, the government does not insert itself in those uh, negotiations, except maybe in rare cases. So, um, you know, I think a lot of folks looking at that think that it's going to continue to be, it's going to continue to turn on leverage that, you know, yeah, it might be another arrow in the quiver, so to speak. It, it may help. Um, for a subcontractor trying to push uh, push back on sort of overzealous flowdowns, but that you know, practically speaking, how much is it going to affect day to day you know, remains to be seen. But I think there's there's some skepticism out there. And then with regard to contracting officers, um, the DFARS uh, 212.301 was amended to provide that you know the contracting officers should not include or shall not include in in contracts um, provisions or clauses applicable to commercial items, unless they're prescribed in FAR Part 12 or otherwise in the, in the FAR or the DFARS. But then it's got this other additional language and it says, or unless it's consistent with customary commercial practices. So, you know, what does that mean? That, that seems like a, that's pretty broad. Um, seemed like, it seems like it gives a good bit of discretion to, to contracting officers to sort of maintain the status quo if, if that's what they're, they're inclined to do. Um, I, you know, I will touch on on it's I don't have a slide on it because it's just a proposed rule now. It should be final by this time next year. But um, the 2018 NDAA, Section 849 of that, had a similar requirement. But it required DOD to look back since FASA, since 1994, and look at every case where the FAR Council decided that it was in the government's best interest not to exempt a new procurement rule, um, not to exempt commercial items from a new procurement rule. And the, the statute there it required DOD to, to look at that and, and get rid of it. Again, the default was you're going to get rid of it unless you make, an, and it uses the language, a case-by-case -case determination providing a specific reason why it's in the government's best interest not to exempt it. And so the proposed rule comes out and it identified two provisions and one clause that they were going to um, you know, make not applicable to commercial items anymore. So, you know, and that's out of, you know, a universe of over a hundred. So I think a lot of observers were disappointed. Um, but then I think what the observers went to was, was okay, well, you, you've got two provisions and a clause, but that means you must've done a case by case determination and provided a specific rationale for all these other, you know, dozens and over a hundred clauses and provisions that you decided to leave in, to, to leave applicable. And, you know, unfortunately, that level of analysis isn't in there. It wasn't done. Arguably, it was required. I, I think, plainly, it was required by, by the statute. It wasn't done. You know, I think we can understand perhaps why it would have been a significant undertaking and it would have been just, you know, ripe for scrutiny in terms of the comments on the proposed rule. But, um, but a number of the commentators have, have taken issue with that approach in their comments to the proposed rule. We'll, we'll see what the final rule looks like. But, um, 
you know, it, it's difficult to change the status quo, as I said at the outset. We can um, we can keep moving. <laughs> yeah, so the Defense Commercial Solutions opening, again, this is an, an effort. Um, it, it implements the um, Section 803 from the 2022 NDAA. Um, I think Jason will touch on it in some of his comments, so I, I won't say much on it other than, you know, th this is, again, meant to reduce some of the barriers to entry to provide an incentive for um, certain technologies, certain innovative solutions to, to sell to the government and provides for a streamlined acquisition process for those companies who have those innovative products. Um, and, it, you know, again, it looks impressive on paper. I think the question is, what is this going to look like going forward? What kind of dollars are we going to see going through this program? Is it going to be something small or is it going to be going to be significant? We can we can go to the next slide. Yeah, I think these next couple of slides I'll go through pretty quickly. Um, we saw some consolidation on the GSA front, looking at the economic price adjustment clauses. There were like four different clauses, and it was really difficult oftentimes for contractors to, to escalate pricing. And particularly with the inflationary times, um, it was an effort to make it you know, more manageable for contractors to the price consistent with um, standard commercial practices. But you know, generally, I think that move was, was applauded. Um, the next slide. Um, and, and then again, also GSA made an effort to get rid of some redundant requirements in their in their uh, clauses, outdated reference among the uh, commercial item clauses applicable to commercial items. We can we can move on. Yeah, so the the class deviation, I, I touch on this. Um, it, it's a little bit of a tangential relationship to commercial item contracting, but the um, the minimum wage applicable to federal contractors, it was enjoined by um, the Southern District of Texas last year in three states, in um, Texas, Louisiana, and, and Mississippi. And it wasn't for, for all contractors in those states, to be clear. It was for state agencies contracting with the federal government that the court said you can't you can't require by executive order that these states implement an, a distinct minimum wage when they're doing work for, for federal contractors. Um, so the Department of Labor has appealed that to the Fifth Circuit. And there, there's a separate case out there in, um, in Arizona, district court in Arizona, where the court actually sided with the administration and said the administration was, was within its rights in establishing that minimum wage for contractors through the executive order. And, and so that case, they sided with the administration um, and that's on appeal to the Ninth Circuit. Um, so you know, there's potential for a circuit split, and we'll we'll see how it how it gets resolved. But you know, I, I think the takeaway here for for me in terms of commercial item contracting is is looking at the executive's authority on the under the Federal Property and Administrative Services Act, which I think for years and years was thought to be, if not unlimited, you know, really close. That, that there was a lot of discretion among the executive to implement. You know, different policies, different preferences through, you know, through its uh, procurement dollars, the hundreds of billions of dollars every year, um, you know, that they could, you know, impact whatever it was, banning text messages when you're driving, um, you know, limiting food waste and um, e-verify different, you know, labor and employment type um, like priorities. And then, I, you know, I think we saw with with the vaccine executive order that there was a num of significant litigation around that. And we started to see that you know, even though many would think like there was just as much of a rationale there than, you know, for any other initiatives in prior years, but um, started to see some of that litigation get traction and, and see courts draw some limits. And um, I think we ended up with a circuit split on the on the vaccine executive order that, you know, is not going to get resolved just because it's, um, you know, not really a live issue anymore. But, you know, we'll see what happens under the, um, the minimum wage executive order. But a, a lot of folks are paying attention to that. We can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, and then a, a couple of quick things here, the DOD, the class deviation um, for the, the clause for acquisitions using the procurement des desktop defense system. That's just in, in some procurements where contracting officers have to check boxes to see what, what clauses apply. You can imagine you get some inconsistencies there. Sometimes that can be a good thing for contractors, sometimes not. Um, but, you know, we've got technology that can automate that so we don't get some of that, that inconsistency. And that's um, that's what that uh, deviation seeks to do. The um, the GAO issued a report. This was required under the FY 2018 NDAA related to the uh, GSA Commercial Platforms Program. Um, and, you know, I don't want to give too much significance to it, but I, but I want to just remind folks of when when that came out as part of the NDAA, 
there was a lot of consternation in thinking that that you know program was going to have significant consequences, either intended or unintended. But there, you know there was commentary saying it, that it was going to you know eviscerate the federal supply schedule program, that it was going to you know be really bad for small businesses seeking to do business with the government. Um, you know, and here we are, six years later, roughly, and, and we see the this report. And um, you know, we had about forty thousand dollars in in um, twenty twenty two under that program. So it didn't really turn out to be significant. When you know, go back a couple of slides ago, when we were talking about the uh, commercial solutions openings again, you know, it's getting some attention. We'll see. Is it, is it going to be a forty million dollar um, program, or is it going to be something more significant? You know, here I think the GAO's report was largely positive. So, you know, it's a good program. They could, you know, maybe target a little bit more um, ability one contractors. They could maybe streamline some of the small business subcontract reporting. But it, it was generally positive, saying it was a good program, had potential to grow, um, but really hasn't moved the needle in the way some observers thought when it when it came out. We can go to the next slide. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to end with this one. This is the, uh, the DOD report regarding, um, you know, the use of commercial items in in developing data analytics, artificial intelligence capabilities. Um, and you know, there's a lot of commercial technologies out there in that space, particularly artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, it's you know, it's become buzzwords and you know, all kinds of companies are out there with all kinds of potential. So you'd think if there's ever, you know, a case where the government ought to be looking to the commercial market for for its own capabilities to meet its own requirements, this would be one. And DOD seems to understand the, you know, the obligation of the applicable statutes there where, where they have to buy commercial where there's a, a product out there that meets its requirements, but they, you know, arguably don't go quite far enough. You know, the, the quote there um, is that they will um, create their own solutions um, only when the commercial solution applications can't be adopted to meet their specific needs. You know, I, I guess that's good to hear. I think Kevin pointed out when we first put this on, that doesn't go far enough. That they've also got to amend their requirements where they can to buy commercial, um, and so you know you just got to wonder. It's you know it's good to see that commitment there, but you, you got to wonder how how real it is. It's is past going to be prologue here, or are we going to uh, going to write a new script? Um, I'm going to end it there, and I'm going to turn it to Jason, who's going to talk about the NDAA. All right, thank you, Sam. And uh, we do see that there's a couple questions, which we'll do our best to get to before the uh, the end of the hour. Um, but I'm here to talk uh, for a few minutes about uh, the provisions of the most recent, as we could go ahead and forward the slides, please. Uh, the most uh, recent uh, provisions affecting commercial item contracting. I've, you know, we all recognize it's commercial products and commercial services now. I'm still using commercial item as a catch-all that catches both of those terms um, as the, the term that we're all familiar with. We've been doing this a while. Um, but the most recent NDAA, the folks are familiar, the National Defense Authorization Act, if Congress does nothing else every year, it will at least pass the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, and so, and every year, uh, you know, I highly recommend going to Title VIII of the NDAA. That is the title of the, the act that most directly addresses issues that affect procurement. Uh, and there's a number of provisions in Title VIII uh, that just specifically relate to uh, commercial item acquisition. We're gonna to touch on some of those today, uh, 801, 875, 811, 813, 843 on this uh, cover slide. And we're going to talk about each of them uh, for a few minutes. Uh, so if we could go to the, the, the next slide, please. All right. And, you know, Sam said, you know, the theme of, uh, you know, what's been happening with regulations relating to commercial item acquisition is that change is hard. All right. So the theme of the NDAA section of this presentation, as it has been for a decade or more, is that Congress keeps saying, please, please, please do more commercial item acquisition, make it easier, faster, cheaper. You know, this goes back, we were talking at the uh, at the in-person session a few weeks ago, FASA is now 30 years old, the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act that gave us, you know, the what we think of as commercial, commercial item acquisition. Um, and Congress in that you know, period of time, every time they, almost every time they've spoken on this subject, they are very pro uh, commercial item acquisition. And this year is no different. So 801 uh, provides that upon, you know, very first section in Title 8, 801, provides that upon the contractor's request, 
DOD, again, the NDAA has addressed DOD, must share its commerciality determination regarding whether a product or service offered by a contractor is commercial in nature, all right? And this is whether they determine, this is whether they determine it's commercial or whether they determine it's not, all right? So the, the DOD contracting officer is required to submit a written memorandum 30 days after award that summarizes the determination of whether a product or service meets the definition and why the product or, product or service was determined to be commercial or non-commercial. And the contractor must, offering the product, must be provided with that determination if requested. Now, I think one thing to be thinking about in this, uh, in this context, you know, if you go and you ask for, let's say you're, you, did, you didn't get the contract, you know, you, you lost. So there, there's going to be some interesting potential questions here uh, about protest rights, I think. You know, it, when you go in and you when when will your, you know, folks who've done protests, been involved in protests know this, particularly when you're going to GAO, there are very strict timelines, you know, 10 days being the, you know, the typical one from when you knew or should have known of your protest ground. All right. So you've lost the award, but you don't get, you know, the the commercial item, you know, the the the, the piece of paper that explains why uh, you weren't determined to be commercial. You don't get that until some time later. I think that kind of question of timeliness issues. We may see some of that coming out of this new 801. Uh, the other issue is, I think, with respect to task and delivery order uh, protests. So what you know, Kevin was talking about with the precipient case. You know, we keep seeing this issue with task and delivery order protests at the Court of Federal Claims. You know, folks know the under under FASA. You know, the, that those protests, for the most part, with some exceptions, almost entirely, if they're over a certain dollar amounts, have to go to GAO. Court of Federal Claims doesn't have jurisdiction, for the most part, over uh, procurements, protests involving task and delivery order procurements. However, there's, you know, percipient puts in question, all right, well, you know, if the determination is about commerciality, if the determination, you know, is about uh, an OCI, if the determination is about, you know, the, the, the agency's fundamental def definition of its requirement, is that decision is that in connection with or you know connected to uh, a, a, a particular task and or task and delivery order procurement, or is it a separate and independent thing that is separately protestable uh, under the Tucker Act at the court? So I think that issue we could also see that pop up. You know, if you get if you start if folks start getting these determinations that say, hey, you're not commercial, you know, will there be an argument even if it's in the context of a task and delivery order procurement that there's somehow jurisdiction? at the court. So, you know, again, be on the lookout. Percipient may answer or help answer that question for us. So definitely be on the lookout for when the federal circuit rules uh, in percipient. Let's move on from 801 to 875. 875 may be my favorite provision in this year's NDAA. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, discussion of it uh, in person a few weeks ago. So the 875 requires the Secretary of Defense to conduct a study and issue a report on the feasibility and advisability of establishing a default determination that products and services acquired by DOD are commercial and do not require commercial determinations. That is truly a breathtaking thought. You know, the notion that everything that the Def Defense Department uh, acquires, products and services, is by default a commercial uh, 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 item, uh, commercial product or service. I mean, that, that turns our concept of military contracting virtually on its head, right? I mean, because if anything has been, you know, kind of the paradigmatic non-commercial kind of contracting, it'd be like, you know, really high-end DOD type of procurement. So, you know, this study is going to be really interesting. I'd be fascinating to work on this study. You know, my understanding is, as this was going through Congress, the initial thought was talking about, like, you know, limiting this kind of thing to, you know, non-traditional defense contractors, you know, defined term, uh, limiting this kind of thing. But, but Congress decided to kind of blow this open wide open. Again, Congress in a very full-throated kind of way saying, we really like commercial item acquisition. We want you to be thinking about it. And again, we'll see how the push and pull of that goes once this gets down into the Pentagon and the bureaucracy starts thinking about this. You know, are we going to be you know, is this going to be a true breakthrough uh, in a DOD procurement, or is this going to be a, a white paper, a feasibility study that comes out and it generates some interest and then it goes, you know, by the by, uh, you know, it's similar to some of the what Sam was talking about uh, with the regs. You know, we'll see. But I think it'll, at the very least, it'll be very interesting reading. And so be on the lookout uh, for when this uh, feasibility report uh, comes out. 
you know, establishing a requirement for a product or service to be determined not to be a commercial product or service. I mean, establish, you know, to, to, to stand, stand up, you know, again, just this very strong preference. So again, just, just be on the lookout uh, for when this comes out. Let's go to the next, you know, next slide. Jeff, I promise I'm I'm trying to get to the to, to try to get to the to the end here on my section. Um, next section, uh, section eight eleven. Um, again, just continuing focus. Uh, this particular uh, provision requires that no later than October of next year, twenty twenty five, DoD develop and implement a streamlined requirements development process to reduce the time needed to deliver capabilities to warfighters, including by maximizing the use of commercial products or services. In accordance with the statutory preference, yeah, and the only thing I note on this one, the the, the language and the statute that specifically addressed to this, revised requirements management practices using a clean sheet approach that avoids prescriptive language. Again, I mean DoD is like be in the Congress, be innovative, don't be so prescriptive, throw out the playbook, start again. So you know, again, I mean the Congress continues this it has for several years to express concern over, you know, how long our acquisition process takes. And, you know, is that resulting, you know, in us losing our competitive edge over particularly the Chinese? I mean, that, that is the concern. That's what is, you know, running throughout all the provisions we're talking about. All right, let's go to the, uh, let's go to the next slide. We'll wrap this up uh, here in the next couple of seconds. Um, again, section 813. So 813 be requires the beginning in 2025 uh, the Secretary of Defense must acquire innovative commercial products and services uh, uh, for a ge at least four times for a geographic combatant command. Again, use the authority that's been given to you. Uh, expand, you know, expansive use of commercial. Uh, and this is this is interesting because it's such a specific direction. You know, to use to acquire innovative commercial products and commercial services at least four times for a ge geographic combat command. That's Congress really getting kind of down into the weeds almost. Section 843 allows certain, and we've been seeing this also more out of Congress over the last couple of years. So Section 843 uh, allows uh, certain property or services being uh, procured to rapidly respond to certain threats. These are threats, you know, these are in support of a contingency operation to facilitate the defense against or recovery from a cyber attack, nuclear attack, uh, et cetera, those kinds of incidents. Uh, allowing uh, certain property or services being acquired in those situations uh, to be treated as commercial products and services for the purposes of carrying out the procurement. So we've, we've been seeing this as well. Even if something isn't technically, doesn't technically meet the definition that we're all familiar with in FAR Part 2 of what a commercial product or a commercial service is, we see Congress saying you know, several times over the last few years, we're going to treat this as if it's a commercial product or service, which again, the point of that is, you know, not as much, not as many uh, clauses supposedly come attached to uh, commercial item uh, contracts, easier, all that kind of stuff to award. So, you know, we see Congress doing this as well. Again, you know, if you remember back a few years ago, the 809 panel uh, had re recommended kind of comprehensive acquisition reform. I don't think we're going to see that comprehensive acquisition reform, but I do think we're going to continue to see Congress trying to like you know, latch on to, you know, parts of the acquisition system that already exists, particularly commercial item acquisition, to try to make things easier uh, throughout, even when, you know, the, the thing that's being purchased doesn't really necessarily meet the definition. I think we'll see that uh, more and more. And Jeff, I turn it over to you to wrap us up. All right. Thanks, Jason. Um, I think we got about seven minutes here. I'll try to blow through. Um this uh, little bit of information here at the end. So we got a couple minutes left to answer questions. Um, so uh, Jason and others talked a lot here about Congress's push for increased acquisition of commercial items. That would take a minute here to talk about what's what's been happening on the ground. Um, uh, and you know, uh, the DCMA's commercial item group or, or SIG was established, um, geez, I'm probably pushing on almost 10 years ago now. Uh, to help facilitate um, uh, more commercial item acquisition, right? They support DOD contracting officers and in making commercial item determinations and in in in, a, in um, making price reasonableness decisions as well. Um, and you can see here uh, that in uh, FY23, the SIG the SIG hosted a meeting back in the spring of of um, spring of 23. 
In, F, in, in government fiscal year 23, however, only about 42% of the term determinations uh, made by the commercial item group uh, were commercial. Uh, that was a bit of an anomaly from the previous three to four years uh, where uh, in the 70 to 80% range were identified as being commercial. Um, the SIG thought that there were uh, a number of reasons for this, uh, but really they highlighted a, sack, uh, a lack of sufficient documentation from um, from uh, companies providing products and services to support the commercial assertions that they were trying to make, um, and they stress that you know they do want to uh, identify uh, things as being commercial products and services and solutions as being commercial, but they needed information from industry to support that. Um, so, what does that mean for industry? Uh, if we could flip to the next slide here. I uh, wanted to share some thoughts uh, as well um, uh, about what contractors might be thinking about if they are going to try to support their commerciality assertions. Um, first, uh, I'll say while while the CID, the commercial item determination and price reasonableness are, are separate and distinct, uh, you really can't get through one without the other, right? Uh, even if you identify something as commercial, procurement's not gonna happen if the price isn't determined to be fair and reasonable. So they need to be considered and supported together. Uh, one way to think about it, you got a product uh, that is clearly commercial, but it has minor modifications, right? The modifications would need to be explained both in terms of commerciality, they'd also need to be explained and supported in terms of how they impact the price that you're offering to the government and the government's price reasonableness um, assessment. Um, uh, you know, second, take a look at FAR part two uh, and the definition of commercial item. You should think about what it is that you're offering, product or service or solution, combination of the two, and where it fits in that definition. Um, and then uh, you need to support commerciality based on that. In general, I say the further down you go in the definition, uh, particularly when you get from products and into services, it gets a little bit harder to support. The holy grail here is actual commercial sales, the same product or service uh, and pricing to show how you price those commercial sales. Um, and for modifications of a type, uh, this gets a little engineering-y, but form, fit, and exp uh, function explanations are really gonna be key here. Um, you know, um, and, 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 and that, again, going back to the, um, kind of the, the, the consolidation of both the commerciality piece and the pricing piece. You need to explain from a form fit and function how it is that the product, service, or solution you're offering meets commerciality. And if there are changes, how it meets commerciality and in terms of how something, you know, the form of something, the fit of something, or the function of something, how that compares to the true commercial product. And then you need to explain how that all impacts pricing. I'll say that this can get really complex it often requires companies to get down to the bill of materials or, or bomb level and kind of look at each component, each piece of a product, service, or solution and, and support it in this manner. Um, um, and, and, you know, I think I'll, I'll stop there because we're really short on time, I believe. Uh, I don't know if we, if we have one or two minutes here, but I don't know if we need to do administrative stuff or if we can attempt to say something about the couple questions we got. Yeah, unfortunately, we are running out of time. We have a little, we have a playoff video to go, and then we, we do need to end promptly at three. So, um, but that was fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation. That was a lot of great information. We will capture the Q&As, and we'll, we'll forward those to the speakers and give them an opportunity to take a look at those and respond. So sorry that we didn't have quite enough time uh, to do some live answers today, but we'll get to your questions as best we can. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our panelists for their presentations and live Q&A. And again, special thanks to our sponsors whose support made this event possible.